there and welcome. We are here again with Men's Morning Light. I am Trapper Jack. So glad you are here today. Our topic today, oh, we are thrilled to have a bishop with us. I mean, like a bishop. I mean, like one of the best I've ever known. Bishop Roger Grease, Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus in the Diocese of Cleveland is going to join us today. Topic is how to pray. There's a how to. There's a how to pray. All kinds of different ways of praying. This fits in so beautifully with as we do the show today, what it says in the gospel. You. He's talking to the disciples, but he's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to the bishop when he says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. We're supposed to be salty Christians. We're supposed to be adding flavor to this world. We're supposed to be adding light to help people see that light of Christ. That's where we're headed today here on Men's Morning Light. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus and be with us today. Hope I so hope you enjoy this. I, I, I hope I enjoy this, and I hope the bishop enjoys this too. It's a thrill to have him here. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe or follow or like or whatever it is you need to do there, okay? So, and notifications and all that so you're around for the next one of these as well. Uh, dare I say this? Dare I say this, that not all masses are created equal? Dare I say something like that? Yes, the same things happen. Yes, the, uh, the bread and wine turn into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, all of that. But who's ever celebrating the mass? You get some salt there, don't you? You get some extra light there, don't you? It, you we feel something. It's not just sensory, but you feel the spirit. You feel the spirit, and that's the beauty of Bishop Roger Grease, and I'm so thrilled again that he's going to be here because he adds that salt. He adds that extra light as well, the spirit in him. For example, I'll give you an example. At my parish, St. Bernadette Parish in Westlake, Ohio, recently we had confirmation. Okay, so, and we're watching, Beth and I are watching online because we love Bishop, the bishop, and, uh, and he's, he's giving his homily, and he says, tell you what, today when you come up for the Eucharist, it can be kind of robotic sometimes, body of Christ, amen, body of Christ, amen. He said, this time, body of Christ, say I believe. It's like, what? That, that's salt. That's salt. That's light. That's what? Say, I believe, the body of Christ. I believe. I, we'll find out how many people uh, did that. Uh, I'm curious how many students and how many adults in the room did because it's a wake up. It's like, oh, yeah, I do. I do believe that that's not bread and wine anymore. Now, this episode is tied in with the Into the Breach series with the Knights of Columbus, produced by the Knights. This particular episode is about prayer, so before we introduce you to the bishop, I want to have a little segment played, a video about prayer, because every single one of us, in all the different ways of praying, every single one of us, somewhere along the way, in our day, we have to stop or begin the day with quiet prayer, solitude prayer, time with, it's just, whether it's the bishop or you or me, that time when we are alone with God in prayer. This is a very noisy world. God speaks to us in solitude. You see this in Christ, the many times that he would go off to the desert or go up to the mountains. The best growth in the spiritual life typically comes around from people who sought that silence and that solitude. Psalm 46, I think it is, be still and know that I'm God. We just have to be still. And that may mean sitting before a tabernacle, sitting before a monstrance, not think about any, anything. Just put yourself in the presence of God. I would strongly urge men to go to Eucharistic adoration. All you have to do is go there and be before God. I always leave with a sense of consolation. I always leave with a sense of peace. When you're discerning something in your life as a man, there is no better place to go than in the silence of Eucharistic adoration, not to discover what you want, but what is God's will for you. Part of that is also reading scripture, reading the, the lives of people who came before you, and so in the saints, things like that. St. Jerome said ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, so we should be reading particularly the Gospels and the Book of Acts, but all of the Scriptures on a regular basis. Pope Benedict has said that the new springtime of the Church will come about through a prayerful reading of the Scriptures. And when we read the Scriptures, it's not just learning more about Jesus, it's learning Jesus from our hearts, of who He really is, coming to know Him as a man. Try to get to Mass on a regular basis as much as possible. There's something really profound and powerful in being able to encounter our Lord through the blessed sacrifice of the Mass. More than Visa or American Express, my rosary beads in my left hip, you know, my pocket are, are the key. And I, I look at life as spiritual warfare. They're beads for the battle. They're like spiritual bullets. And even if I can only get two or three Hail Marys out, I feel as though, you know, the devil's going to duck if not run. You know, many saints have called the rosary a weapon, but it's a weapon against sin and death and the devil. Now, 
as not just this thing to sit there and just go through the bees and be bored, is David and Goliath. What is the Goliath that has you so scared that you're afraid to live our lives as men? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it pornography? And when we begin to defeat the Goliaths in our life with the power of prayer, then we can start taking everything in our life to that next level. Because when your will and God's will are one, that's when you're truly free to be the man who God created and calls you to be. It's so essential, though, that we enter into that sacred silence. There's this in the silence of our hearts that we hear the voice of God. Just put yourself in the presence of God. Lord, I give you this day, and you just sit with it. Into the Breach with the Knights. Check it out online. Go to YouTube and search for Into the Breach Knights of Columbus. This episode about prayer. So delighted to introduce one of the great shepherds out there, Bishop Roger Grees, Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus. Welcome to the show, Bishop. Thank you very much, Trevor. <laughs> Good to be with you. Excellent. And I just, I we were reading up on you today. Yesterday was kind of a big day for you, buddy. Kind of a big day. Yeah, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of my Episcopal ordination. Tell me about that call. Tell me about that that call from the Vatican or however all that worked. Uh, That was rather unusual because we we were celebrating St. Benedict's Day on the 21st of March. uh, Bishop Pilla and a number of the priests were joining with us in the uh, celebration. And uh, after we left, after the bishop left, we got a phone call from downtown saying that there was an important call and uh, Bishop Pilla's wife, uh, mother, uh, was was sick, very sick, and he thought maybe that call was from her, so he rushed home to get the call. Okay, when when I got back to my office, there was a uh, voicemail from Bishop Pilla saying that uh, he had to see me and he was wondering if uh, I could come and see him uh, down down at his office. So I ran down to his office to see him, and uh, as I walked in, he had he had a big smile on his face, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And he said, uh, I just got a call from the papal nuncio that uh, Pope John Paul II was asking you to be an auxiliary bishop at Cleveland. And so that, it came as a complete surprise, I'll tell you, because I still I only had one more year as abbot. After 20 years, I had one more year, and I was going to be able to resign my office and uh, get back into the monastic life. Oh, wow. What, what a surprise. And, and you've been change. a priest for a 58 years you've been a priest, 20 right. years now as of yesterday, a bishop. Right. Uh, everyone always wants to ask a priest the calling. I mean, is that something as a kid you knew this is, this is where you were headed? Oh, as a kid I knew. I used, to, I, used to, I used to say the Mass, played the Mass down in my basement when I was in, the, in grade school. And my grandmother even made me green vestments. Oh, and I, wow. had a bro- I had a, one, a brother one year younger than me, and he used to love to serve as long as I used those Necco wafers for keeping <laughs> <laughs> Everybody used the neck. We actually, my father worked for a parish. He was able to come home with unconsecrated hosts. We yeah. got the, we got actually the, the, the bread. We actually got the real, the real deal there. The real thing. Wow. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it's funny how, uh, how many people have it. I, and my brother was the priest. He was the one with the towel down the back and everything, but yeah. you got actual vestments, man. That's awesome. You know, a lot of talk about shepherds right now. You're, you are a good shepherd. There is, uh, a lot of criticism about our shepherds. Before we get into all the prayer stuff, I'd be, uh, it wouldn't be right if I didn't ask you, are you a little concerned about the shepherding going on in our church right now? Well, uh, I think the devil has a way of uh, dividing people. You know, I think that's his, that's his attack on the, on the world today. We divide people. You know, we, we, have, he put, we have a Catholic president who is uh, not really living the truths of our faith, you know, is one thing, you know, and then we have a... Uh, and the, then the bishops are divided on what to do about it, all that. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that divide, us, divide us. And I think that's the devil's way of getting involved with us. And so I really think that we as, uh, as uh, uh, um, bishops really need to uh, get together and have some common teachings uh, on the gospel and on our faith. Did it concern you then when the, that group of bishops, uh, they're trying to take uh, communion uh, off the table, if you will, of this upcoming conference of bishops. Let's not talk about who should be or shouldn't be getting it, you know, because that's going to get into politicians and 
you have a cardinal giving yeah, Biden I, the, you know, it, it, tell me about that. What do you think? You know, as you know, as I mentioned, as I mentioned at the mass that you referred to with that confirmation mass, you know, that, uh, you know, it's really what do we believe? You know, what do we believe? believe you know and if we don't believe that that's the true body and blood of christ and live it as we heard in the gospel today if we're not the light if we're not the salt of the earth or the life light of the world you know we we shouldn't be going to communion it's up to us you know and there's even a prayer before communion which says you know you know but through the through the reception of your body and blood let, let it not be for my penalty or for my destruction but be for my strength you know and so it's one of those things that you know if we're not going worthily you know, I don't think we should approach the, the communion rail. And I think that's what the bishop in San Francisco is really trying to promote. Very much so. He's been very uh, outstanding in that department. When you hear th that, yeah, go ahead. And I think the bishop's meeting this coming week is going to be a lot on, uh, on getting back to teaching, uh, teaching the, uh, uh, the value and the strength and the uh, truth of the real presence in the Eucharist. When you hear uh, in her apparitions, Mary, I think it was at Akita, Japan, among, among them in La Salette and all these different places, you heard her talking about things like there will be that day, bishop against bishop, priest against priest, uh, and it'll be towards the end of things of this age. Uh, do you take that to heart, that this, this could mean something, that these things are happening now? Well, I certainly think it, they're, they're happening now, without a doubt, uh, Trappery, that those these things are happening all over the world. You know, there's there's more martyrs today in the, around the world than there were in the early Christian, the early years of Christianity. More people are suffering for their faith, you know. And it's uh, we're even going to be suffering here in in the United States as we're going to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're going to be suffering with the uh, this whole pro life issue, you know, and uh, euthanasia. You know, with the, uh, in the in the government today, it's one of those things where, how do we stand up against what we kind of don't believe? You know, what what's against our faith? Yeah, uh, well, and we'll see uh, we'll see how this how this does progress. I know I've heard as far as uh, martyrdom that the 20th century and now into the 21st century has given us more martyrs than the first yeah. 19. Is that is that the number you get to? Yeah, I think so. I, if we just look at the the years, the twenty five years that uh, Pope John Paul II was in office. How many how many saints he canonized? You know, he probably canonized more saints during his term than all the other popes before him. Yeah, let's talk about prayer a little bit here. I think one of the areas that we aren't talk uh, talking that much about in terms of the effectiveness of our prayers is uh, we did an episode on how to kill prayer, how to kill prayer because. <laughs> We have to be in a, in a good place to make our, I mean, let's put it this way. All, not all prayers are created equal. They're just somebody praying is getting prayers answered, somebody not. Let's talk a little bit about that. What keeps, and I think Isaiah wrote about this too, how we kill prayers. Uh, let's talk about where we need to be in our relationship with God for God to be listening. You know, the, there was, uh, uh, when, when the apostles were on their way to Jerusalem and uh, Jesus asked them, you know, who do people say that I am? And, you know, and they gave all kinds of answers, you know, the different, the different prophets and so on. But then, then he stopped and he said, but who do you say that I am? You know, and that was the important one, you know, who do you say that Jesus is? And, you know, that's what we need to ask ourselves. Who do we say Jesus is in our life? But then, if we, even when we get to a, if we get to some kind of solution that we feel comfortable with, I think there's a third question that should come up, and as you know, who does Jesus think you are? You know, <laughs> who does yeah. Jesus think you are? You know, how do how do you relate to Jesus? You know, I I had the uh, I was at the Poor Clares of Perpetual Adoration on on uh, Corpus Christi Sunday last weekend, and uh, we had a procession afterwards, and I tried to relate to the people at uh, you know the uh, you know, with perpetual adoration that the sisters have, you know, when they go in there, they, it's not that they, they, they just look at their monsters. They look at the, the body of Christ in their monstrance. But I said, they, they remember, too, that Jesus is looking back at them because it's, that's, it's a two-way street. It's not just one way. It's not we look at Jesus, you know, in the, in the perpetual adoration. But there's a relationship where he wants, he wants to look at us. And it's the same thing with prayer. You know, we talk. We talk, we talk. We never listen. We never mm -hmm. listen, and it's in the silence. It's the silence. Remember the remember when Moses was taken up on the mountain, you know, and the, and there was a there was a there was an earthquake, and Jesus that God wasn't there, and then there was a fire, and God wasn't there, and then there was a gentle breeze that went by, 
and God was in that breeze. It was in the silence of that breeze that that uh, that Moses found God. And it's the same thing in our life. You know, and that's one of the difficulties I really faced. You know, in uh, in my life, uh, Trapper is uh, after 45 years in the monastery, when we had a time for prayer and we had a time for meditation and we had a time for work. You know, ora et labora is our motto. You know, prayer and work. You know, that's the Benedictine motto. You know, and it's one of those things where there was a time set aside for all that. But when you become a bishop, you know, become a bishop, you know, you get more distracted and you don't, your time always isn't your own and you don't have all these set times. But in my life now, as a uh, auxiliary bishop, I do have, uh, I do have a life where I can get up in the morning and uh, after preparing myself, I get to, to get to my chapel and I'm able to say my, say my morning prayers, you know, with the, with the divine office, and then I'm able to celebrate mass, and then I have some time for meditation and, and prayer. So it's a wonderful opportunity that I have. And then with the Blessed Sacrament in my in my house, you know, in, in my own chapel, I have I have an opportunity every every time I go by that chapel to stop in and say hello, yeah. and to have a to have a little time with Jesus. Because I think that's what that's what prayer really is. Prayer is recognizing the fact that you're always with Jesus, and you should never. <laughs> Never lose an opportunity, whether it's before a meal and you say a prayer or whether you get in the car and you say a prayer or whether, you, or whether you're taking a test if you're in school or whether you're going to work, whatever it might be. You know, always remember that that Jesus is with you, you know, and and prayer is the opportunity to to talk in verbally, to talk in silence or to just talk by your actions as the yeah, as the Bishop. gospel as the gospel went proclaimed to this morning. Bishop Fulton Sheen used to talk too about how. He had to have that holy hour. He had to have, and, and with the, and, and you guys are so fortunate to actually have the Blessed Sacrament. They trust you with the Blessed Sacrament. We don't get to take that home, you know. Love to. I'd love to have that here in the house, but I understand. Uh, but he talked about how for 50 years, this guy didn't miss, 50 years. And if that meant getting up at 2 in the morning because he had a long day as the bishop, that's what he did to spend that, that, that hour. So it, and, and all of us need to be spending at least 20 minutes with that, reflecting on yeah on the day's words and all that kind of good stuff. So I don't know if you're uh, familiar with with uh, Legatus uh, uh, Trapper. Legatus is an organization found by John, uh, Mount, by my, uh, what's his name uh, from uh, Detroit, who started the, who used to own the Detroit Tigers and, and the pizza, Domino Pizza and so forth. McCann, but, McCann, 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 yeah. McCann, you got McCann. It. I'm close. You got it right. you Tom, see, you're close. Tom, <laughs> yeah, whatever his name is. Yeah, that guy. But, okay, what, go but ahead. Anyway, you know, our, he, he really stresses that every every member of that legatus should do three things. They, they should go to daily mass. They should they should go to confession at least once a month, and pray the rosary daily. Those are the three things that he that he recommends for every member of the uh, of the goddess because yeah. he wants the the goddess members to to strengthen their faith and to bring their faith into the workplace to bring their faith into their neighborhoods and into their home and he says the best way best, best way to bring your faith out into those areas is to have a strong faith and that faith comes from from mass reconciliation and rosary amen and if i can since you're in the la goddess la la ladate you're familiar with that app ladate oh, yes, yes, right. El- Right. I'm telling you, if you don't have Ladate on your phone, uh, guys, get, get it on L A U D A T E, something like that. L A U D A T E. Yeah, uh, it has all the it has the readings, it has reflections, it has prayer, it has uh, the verse of the day. I mean, it, it you can go so deep, and uh, it's it's tremendous for faith. So a little plug for that. Talk a little bit about you know we talk often about Joseph and Mary here as well. Uh, talk about Mary. Joseph is now, you know, he's, he's finally getting his own recognition, finally, as uh, the patron saint of the Universal Church. Uh, did you do, do you do as many saints do to Jesus through Mary? How, how, do, you, how do you approach Mary? Well, the Benedictines, uh, you know, <laughs> it was rather interesting uh, because the, the St. Benedict in his rule does not mention Mary at all. Okay, it doesn't mention Mary at all. And so uh, when Pope... Uh, uh, St. John Paul II that asked all, all the religious communities to redo their, uh, their, their order, not their order, but their foundations. And we had to go through that. We had to make sure when we said, submitted our, our, renov- our re- renewed uh, uh, foundation to, the, to Rome that they, they said we had to include Mary. 
okay, because Mary is so much a part of it, but we do. Part of our divine office every night is to uh, sing the Marian Antiphon uh, before we leave, uh, before we go to bed, before we leave the chapel, after yeah. our night prayers. But we also have, you know, we also have a great devotion to Mary. And uh, even uh, when I was a senior at uh, Benedictine High School, my senior class built a big shrine to Mary in the back, uh, in our, behind our school. And uh, I know that uh, one, one of our coaches, Augie Basu, who was a very devout Catholic, who was, I, I looked to as a, uh, I'll tell you in a minute, he was a, I think he's really, he helped me find my vocation. But uh, every day before practice and every day after practice, we would have to stop at that shrine of the Blessed Virgin to, to say a prayer. So yeah. we got it, we, we really in touch with the Blessed Virgin. But anyway, I was, just reading, I was just reading in the uh, the St. Joseph consecration book about how, as a guy, he was the first guy to sit in adoration before Jesus, where he looked at Jesus and <laughs> Jesus looked back at him. I thought that was pretty good by uh, Father Don Calloway. Uh, right. I want to also, also touch on uh, the humility of prayer. This reminds me a little bit of St. Catherine of Siena, where God told her, uh, just understand, I'm God, you're not. <laughs> and, yeah, right. uh, and it takes humility, which is not something that there's a great preponderance of in the world today about about actually believing and understanding that I'm just I'm nothing here without him keeping me going right absolutely absolutely without God we wouldn't exist we wouldn't exist you know he give he breathes life into us the moment we're conceived you know with the he gives us a soul and that's how we are created in his likeness you know and that that is what we we need to carry with us throughout our life to remember that we are always, we're temples of the Holy Spirit, you know, and uh, and it, God is always with us. It dwells within each and every one of us. And that's why, you know, we need a, we need a respect as we're talking, you know, so much in society today is about, about racism and about respect, you know, those things. But we as Catholics know that every human being is created in the image of God, you know, and we have to respect one another because of the, the presence of that divine life in every one of us. Your own humility. I was really touched, and I and, and this is one of my favorite stories. When I recently spoke at First Friday, I mentioned this about you because this speaks a lot to your humility in, when it comes to prayer, and the fact that there are different gifts given to people. And uh, I made reference to the fact that there was a, a letter that was sent to you at one point when I, during those many years when I was affiliated with Doctor Isam Nami, he prays things happen in all the healing services and all. You celebrated many of those masses before the healing service. And at the home parish at St. Bernadette's, which we ended up calling the Miracle Zone, there were just so many miracles going on there all the time. Uh, there was a woman who came with her family. She was end stage. She had hospice in the house. Uh, she was done. She was only in her 30s, too. Anyway, she came. She received a prayer. Everybody's praying for her. She goes back home. The hospice uh, caretaker said, something happened to you. You look different. As it turned out, all the cancer was gone. All the cancer was gone. She wrote you this beautiful letter. You sent that letter. You didn't keep it to yourself. You sent that letter to uh, our pastor at St. Bernadette's at the time, and he had it read at every Mass during the homily time. He, he showed how Jesus is still performing miracles today, something we don't often hear. We don't often hear about how prayers are answered. And, that, and I was just, I sat there in the pews so stunned at something that is so rare that a result of prayer was announced. Not just let's pray, let's pray, let's pray for this, pray for that, but actually what God just did. And that speaks, I think, to your own humility that everybody has different gifts, everybody should be praying, and this can be the result of that prayer. Absolutely. I remember those, I remember those sessions and those masses with uh, Dr. Naomi, and uh, I remember how he always asked me to say a prayer over him before he... Uh, was praying over the people, you know, just that God would God would inspire him with the prayers that were needed for each individual that came forward. And there were some some fantastic cases, uh, Trapper. There was one case I know. There's one case where a, a daughter had uh, had uh, had cancer in her liver or kidneys or something, and uh, and she wanted to go see Doctor Namie and her father, who who was a fallen away Catholic. He didn't believe in the church anymore. He didn't believe in God anymore, you know. And he uh, he went to uh, he, she wanted to go see Dr. Namie, and he refused to take her, and finally he submitted and said, okay, I'll take you. So he, he took her to the church where Dr. Namie was doing his uh, his healing prayers, and uh, 
he stood he just stood behind her you know and uh after the after dr Naimi prayed over his daughter dr Naimi just prayed over him as well and uh you know nothing nothing physical or anything but uh just prayed over him and he he got the holy spirit and uh from that day on not only did he believe in god but he was a daily mass goer he started going to mass every day you know so it's a miracle that took place in his life as well i know i remember that story also yeah. and uh i remember doc hit the father said in fact i think the father got the prayer before the daughter and the father said please heal my daughter and dr Naimi said i heal nobody and then began his prayer <laughs> and boom i think they were all they were all out yeah. uh in right. the spirit and uh and that again, that's the bigger miracle, isn't it? That's the right. beauty and, and what I do with Men's Morning Light or the Touched by Heaven podcast. I like to showcase, the, it's not the miracle. It's not the miracle. that it, The miracle is supposed to wake you up so that you actually want to know who this Jesus guy is. When you think about 3,000 people being baptized in one day, it wasn't because they all learned the theology. They saw the miracle. This has to come from a good place and they were all baptized, and then you can really start learning about Jesus, right? Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? The miracle wake us up, and then away you go? In my humility, uh, I think I mentioned that that same uh, homily that you heard about was, uh, I mentioned the, what brings me so attracted to the Mass and during my 58 years of the priesthood is uh, just the words of consecration. When I hold that host up and repeat the words of Jesus, uh, this is my body, which is given up for you, and I look at that host and I think, a miracle has taken place because that is no longer bread. It's the risen body of Jesus Christ, body and blood, soul and divinity. I'm holding, I'm holding Jesus in my hand, you know. And said that, and that's what I try to share with the people too, is that they get to hold Jesus in their hand as well when they receive communion. And that's why I asked them to say, "I believe," to try to strengthen their own faith that this, that they, they appreciate and understand what's happening. And isn't it interesting? Well, we were, uh, my wife and I were out at Our Lady of Lourdes Shrine here locally, where miracles happen. And we were, and we, of course, obviously, you think of Lourdes, you think of the healing waters, St. Bernadette, and all of those kinds of things. But one of the nuns out there told me, she said, actually, there are more miracles associated with the Eucharist than, than with the healing waters, which, is, which shouldn't be a surprise to us when you think of all the people that go from those right. waters to, to Mass or before or after. It's not a surprise. Uh, the Eucharist is so healing. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's let's wrap things up a little bit here. Um, just uh, let's just touch the guys and and the women who are watching here as well. Once again, about prayer. I I think I think sometimes we stumble. We we I hear people say, I don't pray the Rosary because I I it's I don't know it takes too long and my mind wanders. Well, that's the point. Your mind wanders and then it comes back. Your mind, the Holy Spirit, can be taking you someplace that maybe you're supposed to focus on. Or sometimes I don't know what to say. Uh, often it is just listening, isn't it? It's just, and then you hear, and then you hear. Well, I'm not hearing anything. God uses God uses the entire universe as a canvas. He could say something to you in a quiet moment, or in an email, in a radio commercial, or a song, or whatever. Uh, I'm hoping that everybody who certainly watches Men's Morning Lights and Touched by Heaven the podcast understands that. God uses his, his entire creation to communicate with us. I don't think the only way Bishop Roger Grease hears the word of God is just while reading scripture, is it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My whole vocation is uh, an example of uh, hearing God's voice uh, through my life because I loved, uh, I loved teaching and I wanted to be a teacher and I loved football and I wanted to be a coach and I loved... I love the masses. I mentioned it from an early day, and I wanted to be a priest, and it led me to be a Benedictine monk because there I could do all three things. I was a teacher in the high school, and I was a coach on the freshman football team, and I was able to have mass weekly out of parish. I think I just yeah. read it in the, in the Psalms, rejoice and be glad. That is you. That's why I say not all masses are created equal. They are, <laughs> but they aren't. Anybody who, who leaves a mass with Bishop Roger is lifted. Uh, Bishop Perez, who was here before, of course, be, uh, you know, before going off to Philadelphia, he had that quality too. There was just this uplift and joy, which is what we should be experiencing at those yeah. masses. Uh, and you have that. Uh, your famous line is something about uh, what is it? God is what? God is good all, all the time. time. <laughs> <laughs> You've been saying that for how long? That has been your uh, your 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 calling card for how long? 
<laughs> long time when Bishop Perez came, you know, he first is at his opening uh, talk at the uh, installation. He said, God is good. And everybody answered all the time. And he looked at me and he says, hey, Bishop Roger, did I get that right? <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. Let's uh, let's just all be reminded we need to it, it's what the catechism says. It's what just it's raising our mind to God. Right. It's something that's what a prayer is. It's just lifting our right. mind to God. I'd like to close out this uh, this episode about prayer with you. You finishing it up with with a prayer. Where would you like to take uh, our prayer here uh, today? Well, I think as long as we're as long as we're still moving through this year of uh, St. Joseph, let us ask uh, St. Joseph uh, to help us because St. Joseph uh, He's most renowned and he, he really comes to the floor because he, he listened to the voice of the Lord in dreams, you know, and, and when, he, he, when he arose from those dreams, he put into action what he had heard in those dreams. And so we too, in our sleep and in our, in our times when we feel we, we don't hear anything, God is speaking to us and there will come something in our life where we will understand what God is trying to tell us and what direction God is want, wants us to go in. And so today, as we pray to St. Joseph, St. Joseph, we ask you to intercede for us as you, as you took care of Mary and, Joseph, and Jesus in the, at, in, the, in, the, in the little town of, of, Nazareth, of Nazareth. We ask you to be with us today and be with our world. Bring our bishops together. Bring our church together. Bring our world together so that once again, we can truly be the body of Christ present and be the salt of the earth to each and every one of us. A salt that never goes flat and be the light that never goes out. Through our baptism, we've received the gift of the Holy and confirmation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let that spirit direct our lives so that we may find you each in every corner of the world. And so we ask your blessing now on all who are gathered together and through the intercession of St. Joseph and through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and asking all things through Christ our Lord. We ask a blessing upon all the listeners of this podcast. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Bishop Roger Grease, and thank you for watching Men's Morning Light. See you next week. <laughs>